Good morning. Good morning. We welcome all of you to worship this morning. It's good to see each of you, uh, both those who are here and those who are on Zoom. Uh, just looking at my phone quickly, we've got at least six or seven states represented this morning, which is about par for the course. So welcome everybody uh, who's joining us online as well. Just join me now in our call to worship printed in the bulletin. I'll begin with the light print. Please follow with the bold. We are all of us created by God. In the image of God. In all our glorious differences. We reflect the holy face of God. All who gathered this morning in worship across the country and around the world are brought near to God through Jesus. We are not Jew or Greek, low class or high class, male or female, gay or straight, black or white, citizen or immigrant. We are one in Christ Jesus. So let us love each other and worship our God with joy. Let us pray. O loving and gracious God, we have come here this morning to worship. And we've already been reminded that we are created in your image. If we look and listen and pay attention to others, we realize you must have wanted us to be different from each other. But yet we hear that it is not your intention for us to be put in either or categories that can be used to put limits on who you want us to be. Help us to know in your great love you intended all the beautiful variety in humanity to add to the richness of life, not for us to use these differences to cause division. Forgive us that so often we go down that road. We pray today that we look deeper and not be quick to categorize and label others. We pray that we learn again that in Christ's family, we are equals and all your children have worth. May this church, the people, and this church building be a place where we can be who you want us to be, that all feel safe and supported, encouraged and challenged in helpful ways, where all are valued and respected, where all are welcome and love is found. Amen. Okay. We'll stand now and sing All Are Welcome. Mindy's going to play through the verses, the first verse, before we start. And um, we have sung this before, but some people may be unfamiliar or, like me, forgotten exactly how it's, the tune starts. So she'll stand if you're able and, or want to, and Mindy will start. Let us build a house where prophets speak and pray. 
receiving the uh, One Great Hour sharing offering in this month of June, and we've got a uh, video to tell you a little bit about that offering. Hunger is defined as a condition in which a person does not have the physical or financial capability to meet basic nutritional needs for a sustained period. It can be brought on by disasters, poverty, or fleeing conflict. The experience of hunger to those who are hungry goes deeper. Food sustains life. Responding to hunger is an affirmation of life. One great hour of sharing is responding to hunger issues no matter the cause, both locally and globally. With programs to address the root causes of food insecurity and bring real and sustainable change, by working together, side by side, one community at a time, all around the world. And with your support, we will not grow weary. We will indeed harvest a good crop. The need has never been greater. The opportunity is now. It's time to share.
sing some more I would like it <laughs> just want to make sure you were finished our scripture this morning is from the book of Galatians starting with the first verse of first chapter and Paul is sort of introducing himself as he writes this letter Paul an apostle sent neither by human condition nor from human authorities but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the members of God's family who are with me. To the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to set us free from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there's another gospel, but there are some who are confusing you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. And then a couple other very familiar verses from Galatians in chapter 3, verses 28 and 29. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Now we'll sing again. Um, 2204 in your black hymnal, Light of the World. Serve and shine. So how could? 
We continue reading in Galatians, from Galatians chapter 6, uh, beginning with the first verse. My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work. Then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride. For all must carry their own loads. Those who were taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh, but if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those of the family of faith. In recent weeks, we looked at churches that Paul established in a couple of cities, in Thessalonica and in Corinth. We, we read passage, passages in Acts about Paul establishing the church, and then we read from letters Paul wrote to those churches sometime later. Well, we're going to look at two more churches in this way. Today, the churches of Galatia, and next week, the church in Philippi. Now, Galatia is not a city, it's, it's a region. It's part of what is now Turkey, kind of right in the middle in central Turkey. And this letter of Paul wasn't written to a single congregation. It was intended as a circular letter that would be passed around among these churches, by and large churches that Paul had established. I mean, he couldn't do a Zoom call back then, right? He couldn't even do a, a, a mass email. To, to communicate to a group of churches, you wrote out a letter by hand, someone took it to those places, and it was read out loud, probably, uh, probably in the midst of a worship service. Well, there's some tough talk in this letter. It's sometimes helpful for me to think about, you know, these letters in the New Testament being read out loud in church on a Sunday morning and imagining how it must have gone down. Some people might have been looking around the sanctuary, figuring that, oh, this is, he's talking about so-and-so over here when, when Paul says this, or maybe people just kind of look down at their feet. There's a lot of challenge in what Paul has to say, but there is also a lot of hope. Now, the book of Acts only contains a couple of passing references to Paul and Timothy going from place to place in the region of Galatia. So for background, Susan read for us the opening verses of Paul's letter to the Galatians, and then from a, a key and well-known passage in chapter 3. From Paul's first words, and then from what he chooses to write about, it's obvious something big is going on. A huge issue was the, the ethnic and cultural divide that existed within and among the churches in Galatia. Paul was seeking to build bridges and to unify people across partisan divides that had formed in the early Christian movement. There were divisions between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, divisions based on ethnicity, divisions based on wealth and legal status. There are questions and divisions about the role of women in the church. Up to this point, at least, the gifts, that the church was far ahead of the culture in honoring the gifts of women, but apparently everyone wasn't totally on board with that. Now, I know all this is hard to imagine because we probably have no experience, we probably have no frame of reference for something like a partisan divide or cultural differences. I mean, it might be hard to imagine living through a time when differences in viewpoints can serve 
to drive a wedge between people and between groups. Or maybe it's not so hard. Let's pretend for a moment that within our culture, maybe even within the Christian community, possibly even within our own families, there were such strong differences of opinion that folks could lose sight of their identity as brothers and sisters in Christ. They could lose sight of their shared faith. They say nothing of their shared humanity. Well, this is to say that Paul's words to these churches in Galatia facing division and infighting, they are words for us today. And so to a church facing deep division, he writes, there's no longer Jew or Greek, there's no longer slave or free, there's no longer male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And then in contrast to living for ourselves, which destroys community, Paul talks about what it is to live in community with one another. It's the work of the Spirit, he says. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Well, all this brings us to our scripture for the, this morning from Galatians chapter 6. There is a lot in these tense, 10 verses. It is kind of a, a dense text, but I want to look at a couple of things. First, there's this interesting contradiction, it would seem. Verse 2 says, bear one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Beautiful words, and that's really the heart of what it is to be a Christian community. We are to be about bearing one another's burdens. But then just a few verses later, Paul writes, for all must carry their own loads. Well, which is it? Bear one another's burdens or carry your own load? This actually is not uncommon in the Bible. In Proverbs 26, we read, do not answer fools according to their folly or you will be a fool yourself. Answer fools according to their folly or they will be wise in their own eyes. Two completely different viewpoints, one verse right next to the other. Which is it, answer fools or don't answer fools? Well, these kind of contradictory statements can be a problem if you see the Bible as giving unbending, absolute rules for living. But if we look at the Bible in, in that kind of literalistic way, we can miss a lot of the wisdom that it has for us. The point is that both of these statements are wise, and we have to determine how to live it out. We have to decide what fits and what's needed in a given situation. We are called to bear one another's burdens. The connotation here is of, of like a, just an overwhelming load, like a boulder to carry. There are burdens we cannot possibly handle on our own. Now we all know this to be true, of course. Even in recent days and months, those we know well, even some of us here this morning have faced pain and hardship, sometimes almost more than we feel we can bear. It could be a crushing loss that just shakes you to your core. It might be an addiction that has eaten its way into your soul. It might be a terrible illness or a sense of hopelessness that has washed over you. Or it might be any of these sorts of things that affect someone close to you. There are those times that we, we just cannot go on by ourselves. Those times when we are just overwhelmed. And so we need one another. It's a great comfort to know that someone is there and someone has your back. Bearing one another's burdens is actually the basis for a lot of our mission work. We're receiving the One Great Hour Sharing Offering this month as a way of helping those who have been through disasters, who have endured devastation and can't make it on their own. In fact, you might have caught in the video, they use these verses from Galatians. You know, we will not grow weary, we will raise a good crop. Those who have lost everything in a place like, like Greenfield, 
They need others to help bear their burdens. Folks who've lost everything in, in a flood or a wildfire can't bear their burdens alone. Those who have escaped war zones or are living through a time of war in Gaza and Israel and Ukraine and in, in so many places, they desperately need help. Not to mention folks in our own lives facing all kinds of struggles. So we are to carry one another's burdens. Sometimes I'll help you with your burden, and sometimes you will help me with my burden. But then there are those times when we also need to carry our own load, when we need to pull our weight, so to speak. We all know the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Are you familiar with the iron rule? The iron rule is part of community organizing, part of groups like, like Amos. And the iron rule says, never do for somebody else what they can do for themselves. That doesn't mean we shouldn't carry one another's burdens, and it doesn't mean we don't care about others. The iron rule actually means we do care about others. And because we value others, we don't take away the autonomy, we don't take away the agency of other people. We allow them to speak for themselves. We don't do things for people. We work alongside others. Members of the community gain power as they find their own voices. I think of that line from the hymn, they'll know we are Christians by our love. It says, well, guard each one's dignity and save each one's pride. There was a book written several years ago called When Helping Hurts. It talks about how well-intentioned attempts to alleviate poverty sometimes can make things worse. So maybe we collect a bunch of lightly used t-shirts and we send them to some poor remote village somewhere. It might make us feel good about ourselves, but it puts native artisans and clothes makers and shops out of business. It can actually make things worse and can reinforce a culture of dependence. Well, when the text says carry your own loads, it's not talking about those heavy burdens that we all need help with. It's really referring to the daily work of discipleship. We're all responsible for our own faith, for our only relationship with God, for our own way that we serve the Lord. Nobody can do that for us. So really, Paul's talking about responsibility to and for the community, and at the same time, responsibility for ourselves. Bearing one another's burdens and carrying our own load, they're both true. But this is hard work. Caring for others, looking out for those who are carrying heavy burdens, it can, it can wear us down. Being responsible to do the right thing, doing right both by others and ourselves, not to mention doing right by God, it can be hard. It can be tiring. So Paul says, let us not grow weary in doing what is right. Seriously? I mean, we're all tired, probably. Doing what is right is work. It can be draining when we are working and hoping and praying for what is right and we see what is wrong doing pretty well, it can be tough. It is tiring to be driven by our faith to work and work for peace, for understanding, for reconciliation, to, to bring communities together, to work toward a community that really cares and to feel like it's going nowhere. It is wearying to work for the good of our community and the good of our society and feel like it's been for naught. How long have we worked to make this a community where everybody has a decent place to live? We have Ames Ecumenical Housing and Story County Housing and Habitat for Humanity and Home for a While and the Story County Land Trust and more. Good Neighbor provides assistance for people who are behind on rent and utilities 
Amos is advocating for affordable housing. We're actually building some affordable housing in Ames on the side of the old middle school now. But there's still plenty of people who work in this community but can't afford to live here. So we can grow weary of continuing to work and not seeing a lot of progress. I think of social workers and school teachers and counselors and healthcare workers, who people who every day hear heartbreaking stories and then get up and go to work and do it again the next day. I think of volunteers who see human need over and over and who keep on volunteering. There are plenty of parents struggling to raise their children, others who are caregivers for loved ones and do that gladly, but it's hard and it's tiring. Doing what is right can make us weary. But Paul says to this community that is divided and yet trying to do the right thing, trying to come together as community, trying to be salt and light for others, Paul says, do not grow weary in doing what is right because we will reap at harvest time. Our efforts will bear fruit. We are making a difference even if we can't see it at the moment. Mary Jacobson was a retired school teacher and she was listening to NPR one morning when they interviewed a best-selling writer of young adult fantasy novels. And this author had the same name as a student that she had taught 40 years before. She wondered if it could possibly be the same girl she had taught. Well, Jacobson's daughter found the author's website. Under biographical information, it mentioned the school where Jacobson had taught. So it was the same student. But then her daughter kept reading and was stunned to read her mother's name. This best-selling author told how her teacher, Mrs. Jacobson, had made a big impact on her life as a writer. Forty years later, this retired teacher learned about the difference she had made for this particular student. Now, we don't always get that. We don't always find, we don't always know the results of our efforts. But we're told that our efforts will bear fruit. How do we keep on keeping on? How do we not grow weary in doing what is good? It is a choice that we make every day, and it becomes a part of who we are. We have been blessed by God. God loves us always and no matter what. As we experience that love and share that love in our community, bearing one another's burdens, God gives us the strength and the courage and the power that we need, along with an assurance that a harvest will come. Now, one thing I love about these churches that Paul writes to in Galatians is that they don't have it all together. They have issues. They have problems. In other words, it's an actual real-life community. And the good news is you don't have to have everything together in order to bear one another's burdens. You don't have to have a perfect life in order to keep on working for good. A church doesn't have to be absolutely perfect in order to make a positive difference. Praise God for that. Keep on bearing one another's burdens and let us not grow weary in doing what is right. Amen. All right, let's pray. Almighty God, different as we are in so many ways, with different backgrounds and different life experiences, coming from different places, being of different ages, having different interests, 
with different opinions, even different ideas about faith, as motley a bunch as we are, by your Holy Spirit, you have made us one. You have called, you've called us into the body of Christ, and we are all your children. For all of that, we offer our praise and our thanks. Help us, Lord, to see your presence in the hearts and the lives of others, even those who are very different from us. Grant that we might be united in a fellowship of love and hope, and give us the courage to carry our cross and respond to the needs of our world. Lead us, dear God, that we might not weary in doing what is good, but that we might bear one another's burdens and have each other's backs and see one another through the hard times. Give us grace and give us the stamina to follow you and to be your hands and feet and your heart in this world. We all have concerns in our hearts, O oh God, and we lift them all up to you. Concerns for friends, concerns for family, concerns for ourselves, worries and concerns about this world. We lift all this to you, praying that your will and your ways might be done. We pray this morning for Jenna. We pray for healing, that she be feeling better soon. All of this we offer before you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The closing hymn is found in your black hymnal, number 2229. We are one in Christ Jesus. Uh, there's a verse in English. There's a second verse in Spanish. So we're going to sing two verses. Or do you want to do three verses? I don't know. All right. We'll sing it in English. Then we're going to try Spanish on the second verse. And then we'll go back to English for the third verse. All right. If it's too hard, you can sing it three times in English. But let's go, let's go for it.
And now by the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you now and always. Go in peace to bear one another's burdens and love and serve the Lord. Amen.